Okay, so good evening. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Kimberly Kay. I'm the Director of Operations and Editorial Development with the Legal Insurrection Foundation, um, where we do an awful lot of work with very few people. I'm really excited about this evening's event. We'll be discussing wokeness in the military. This directly connects to some of the work we've done on the subject. Um, and with us tonight, we have Professor Jacobson, who is a clinical law professor at Cornell Law School and is also our fearless leader here at the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Um, and then we also have uh, Matt Lohmeyer. Did I, did I say that correctly? I hope so. Feel free to correct me if I butcher it. Um, who has had firsthand experience uh, dealing with this particular issue and is going to share his, his story with us um, and share, I guess, a lot of what he has encountered with this particular subject as well. Um, as we always do with our events, we're not going to sit around and complain about a problem. We look for solutions and how you can be involved and you can be engaged. Um, and so th those are some things that we'll discuss very quickly. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way. First of all, this event is being recorded. So just to save you the email, yes, I will be sending a copy of it in about a week or so. We'll also publish it to the blog when it's edited and ready for for sharing. Um, we will be answering questions towards the end of tonight's program. You'll see that there's two separate sections. There's one called Q&A and one called chat. Uh, q and I'll be monitoring uh, for questions throughout the event, which we will get to later on. We hope to, to have a good discussion there. Um, chat, feel free to drop in there and chat amongst yourselves. I'll be engaging there too if there's any links to share and I'm sure we have plenty for information including Matt's book. I'll be putting all of that information there to make it easy for you to find. Um, and so with that, I just wanna tell you very briefly about Le the Legal Insurrection Foundation, who we are. Um, then I'm gonna pass it to Professor Jacobson who is going to discuss a little bit more our work, our research on this particular subject issue. And then Matt's going to share his story. And then once we get through that, we'll be happy to take your questions and we look forward to doing so. So the Legal Insurrection Foundation, we're actually coming up on our fourth year. I'm really excited about that. The Legal Insurrection blog has been around for far longer than that, but we launched a 501c3 uh, almost four years ago. And we did that to enable us to raise more resources so that we could do the in-depth research that we'll be discussing with you tonight. One of our big projects and one that I oversee is called criticalrace.org. On that website, you will find a comprehensive database that catalogs hundreds of institutions of higher education. We've covered military, um, the military service academies. We've covered med schools. We've covered our elite private schools as well. So there's a lot of fantastic information there if you were curious about what is happening on these campuses. And so with that, I'm going to toss this over to Professor Jacobson, who's going to share a little bit about what we found in that research. I thank you, Kimberly, and thank you, Matt, for taking the time to share your views because we've done a lot of research, we've done a lot of things, but I've never served in the military. And so you have a much closer perspective as to what is going on. So the title is tonight, How to Save the Military Service Academies, uh, as distinct from the military in general, but I think they're probably very interrelated from wokeness. And the question then becomes, well, what is wokeness? And one of the things that we have found, <laughs> whether it's critical race theory or whatever it happens to be, is you get into these circular arguments, arguing over what the meaning of is, is. And we don't wanna do that. I think that when it comes to wokeness, to paraphrase Justice Potter Stewart, when talking about obscenity laws in a very famous opinion long ago, he said, we may not be able to precisely define it, but I know it when I see it. Uh, and that is to some extent what wokeness is about. Just to give you a couple of definitions uh, or uh, descriptions of it, uh, uh, a writer at City Journal, Theodore Kupfer, wrote, wokeness, most observers would agree, can be defined as the progressive worldview 
that views all racial and sexual disparities as proof of discrimination and rejects liberal procedural traditions in favor of totalizing politics that seeks to dismantle those disparities and silence dissenters. It's a little obscure. I like this one better from Woke Temple, which is wokeness is an illiberal, intolerant, quasi-religious ideology that uses performative compassion for alleged victim groups to achieve power, moral superiority, and social status. It requires no personal sacrifice and often advocates for policies that harm marginalized people, particularly pop popular among the privileged and university educated. And then I think that's what we refer to as wokeness is really about a power play. It is um, derived in many ways from critical race theory, a view that the US is uh, systemically racist, irredeemably racist, um, that capitalism can is the core source of the problem and Western culture is the core source of the problem. And wokeness is one of the ways that power, in my view, is exercised. It's by putting you on the defense, it's by calling you names, by seizing the false moral high ground uh, and presuming that identity politics is all that matters. And we've seen that across the educational landscape. Um, I've seen that my entire career. I certainly see it now at a university. And it's the sort of thing that in um, criticalrace.org, we've documented for higher ed, for elite K-12 to private schools, for medical schools, and for the military service academies. And that was the last new database we rolled out. Mercifully, unlike the 500 plus we have in regular universities and colleges, there are only a handful of military service academies. And, but to me, that's, I think the medical schools are really bad, troubling, but the military is something that's very concerning. The cohesiveness of the military. As a civilian, uh, we need the military there, okay? And we need them to operate as one force and not be dragged apart in this identity politics um, that we see. And the way I've always described, or I've described in a lot of interviews about what we found in the military academies is it's not as bad as it is in the rest of higher ed and the rest of academia. But I think critical race theory and wokeness has established a beachhead to use a, a quasi-military term. It's beginning to creep in there. And uh, so we have found that at um, various uh, institutions. So uh, just looking, getting ready for tonight, I reviewed some of our research that got published at various national publications. And so uh, at the Air Force Academy, students are required to watch a video that promotes support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, according to the US Academy video, uh, it's required training for inbound cadets. You may like the Black Lives Matter movement, you may dislike it, but why is it mandatory for uh, incoming cadets to have to be subjected to that? What military purpose does that serve? At, the, at West Point, cadets are mandated to go through uh, various trainings, which include a classroom slide labeled white power at West Point, um, things like that. Now, some of these have, when there was attention paid to them, have been walked back. But you can see that it's beginning to be established. And again, at West Point, Judicial Watch obtained a slew of documents pursuant to a Freedom of Information Act request, and that it had a presentation uh, that discussed whiteness. It had a slide that said, in order to understand racial inequality in slavery, it's first necessary to address whiteness uh, and referred to another graphic referred to the U.S. as a modern day slavery state. Uh, and, and so the question becomes, this is what we see all over the place in regular academia. It's really not surprising in academia. It's frankly, it's just baked into the landscape. But why at the military academies? The one place in society, as an outsider looking in, you would think they would need to bring people together if you're going to, you know, again, as a civilian, at least my conception is that if you have a fighting unit, you want them cohesive. You don't want them disliking each other. You don't want them looking at each other based on the color of their skin or their ethnicity 
you want them looking at each other as, as co-members of the United States Army or the Air Force or the Marines, and they're, they're one. Uh, and so that's what I find very troubling. I really want to hear from Matt because he's the insider. This is my civilian perspective looking from the outside. It's beginning to get present in the military. Um, it's beginning to get present in the military service academies. And maybe at the end in the Q&A, we could talk about how you stop this. But to me, one of the ways you stop it is sunlight. Um, and uh, so that's my outsider perspective. That's what we found. It's established a beachhead, but there was publicity and some of it's been walked back. And I'd like to turn it over to Matt to tell us his story, which is fascinating. Uh, tell us about his book, uh, which you should all order and also tell us where he sees things heading. Thank you, Professor Jacobson, and thank you, Kimberly, for hosting this. Um, it may seem uh, initially, as I offer some preliminary thoughts, that it's um, sporadic or chaotic, but I do want to address just a couple of things that I've already heard, and I think you've done a nice job trying to give us a couple of definitions of wokeism. I was with James Lindsay a couple of months back at a particular event, and if you're familiar with his work, you know that he he says, I read Marx for a living so that other people don't have to. <laughs> and I asked him um, for his elevator speech on wokeism, his elevator speech on CRT. These are things with which I'm familiar. I've studied, I've written about, but I've, I've said a number of places before. I haven't yet quite got down an elevator speech for these things. They're kind of difficult to uh, properly define uh, in a soundbite. And he says, well, I haven't got it down either because um, I keep finding myself having to write it out in 60,000 words or more in a book. And I think he's written six or seven books now about these issues. And it, and it goes to show you that this isn't a problem that's easily um, captured in a soundbite. Uh, I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, first, though, I, I'm not watching the chat carefully. I'm not going to. And so if the stars link isn't up there, I'd request Kimberly to add that as well uh, as anything else you've added at stars with two R's dot US so that people have that site. Uh, Kimberly said at the beginning, we won't just complain about a problem. And I like that. Although, unfortunately, sometimes people confuse what I have to say about the issue with complaining about a problem because it's, it's impossible to solve uh, the problems we're going to talk about tonight without being somewhat informed of what that problem consists of. And uh, it's demotivational. It's discouraging. To hear about uh, what's taking place in our military uh, can sound like complaining. So I'll try and do my job, my job well of not getting emotional because it, it can be a quite emotional issue if you've been close to it and simply laying out some of what I've experienced uh, and hopefully we'll get into some solutions to these problems as well. Uh, I also want to say something briefly about um, not as bad as the other schools, for example, the Ivy League schools. I think uh, at a glance that's true, but it really depends on the classroom and the teacher, uh, for example. Uh, there are some West Point cadets who have learned of STARS and have um, been compiling some of their training slides and emails and texts and some of what they're hearing in their classrooms, for example. Uh, who would have ever thought that in a geography class you'd be introduced to Ibram Kendi and how to be an anti-racist? Um, if you're wondering what that has to do with geography, you're not alone. Our service members, our cadets at West Point are wondering the same thing. So while one student and one cadet in one classroom might be exposed to some of this stuff, the next cadet right down the hall might not be hearing anything about it at all. And so it's good that STARS has become this organization with which I'm working and I'm the director of operations for, is working as kind of an intelligence source in an effort to further educate the American people and our service members about what exactly is happening at our service academies, but it's more broadly than that. It's not just about saving our service academies, uh, at the same time that we were seeing this wokeism, critical race theory, uh, show up at our service academies, we were seeing it crop up at bases all around the globe. And that's, I suppose, a good segue to briefly sharing a little bit more about my story. Uh, my book is Irresistible uh, Revolution, Marxism's Goal of Conquest and the Unmaking of the American Military. I published it in May of 2021 while I was in command of the 11th Space Warning Squadron, which is one of two 
uh, squadrons that's responsible for our uh, space-based missile warning enterprise in the Space Force. I'd been in command uh, for just about a year at the time that I'd published that book, and I was not a political animal. I'm conservative. I didn't care what other people's political views were, but I did care that at the base at which I was located, Buckley Air Force Base, now Space Force Base, I had an activist base commander who liked to use his, uh, one, as one person called it, bully pulpit to push a political ideology. It happened to be a left-wing political ideology. It sounded and smelled an awful lot like what Professor Jacobson described as the woke movement. Uh, particularly, it looked an awful lot like what Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin described in his confirmation hearings were his priorities for national security or national defense. It was global climate change, the COVID pandemic, and white supremacy or radicalism within the ranks. Those were, those were the greatest threats to national security laid out by the Secretary of Defense, unfortunately, made a lot of service members scratch their heads. But I had a base commander that was very interested in talking about the um, systemically racist roots of, uh, the, uh, of the United States, about the Declaration and Constitution, which we take an oath to support and defend, uh, as being um, the result of white supremacy and an attempt to codify white supremacy in the country, and that we've never really been able to escape those racist roots. And so therefore, ipso facto, we're an irredeem irredeemably racist country. And I recognize that um, right away as being very much connected to Marxist ideology. I had come out of a DOD strategy school. We studied the Cold War a lot, and I took a particular interest in Marx's writings and uh, studied communist revolutions in the 20th century. And a lot of the oppressor versus oppressed narrative that plays out in the four parts of Marx and Engels' 1848 Communist Manifesto were present in a lot of the talking points we were hearing at our base. And I recognized uh, at once that all of our support for the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, which was uh, admittedly and outwardly, overtly racist, um, you have both racist and Marxist. Uh, they said they were trained Marxists. Uh, and so I thought, you know, this is a problem that we're facing of Marxist indoctrination. And it's usually presented to us with... Uh, by people who are kindly in their demeanor with smiles on their faces. How, how is it that we uh, help service members recognize this for what it is, and that's indoctrination? Uh, and so hopefully in two to three minutes, I'll share with you a, a, what was a year-long journey for me uh, that led to kind of where I'm at now and what I'm doing. Uh, I recognized it. I called the commander of the Space Force, General Jay Raymond. We had a phone conversation about it. I was his aide-de-camp a couple of years prior to that point. Expressed my concern that I was hearing anti-American rhetoric from the base commander. Uh, there were black-only events. There was an oppressor versus oppressed narrative that was racially based. Uh, whites were the bad man, uh, and blacks were the oppressed man, so to speak. I'm saying that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but that was the narrative. And he agreed with me that this was a big problem. A couple of months later, in September of 2020, President Trump issued an executive order banning the use of critical race theory, vocabulary, and jargon in the uniformed services and in all federal agencies. You may remember that. And there was a big sigh of relief that washed across all of the services because some of the bases, like my own, were tired of being indoctrinated and hearing some of this from activists. Uh, that continued at my base, unfortunately, despite the executive order. And so I filed a formal written Inspector General's complaint, uh, listed 24 witnesses trying to uh, help us uncover this problem to senior leaders so that they could investigate and take action. Unfortunately, that was filed during the presidential election of 2020, a uh, highly politicized time, of course. And uh, they sat on that complaint through November, December, and January, and January 6th happened. The next day, I received a written response to that complaint, uh, dismissing my complaint. And so I set about uh, somewhat frantically writing the book, Irresistible Revolution, that you've just heard of. I figured, as Professor Jacobson has pointed out, I was uniquely situated to write it. I was in uniform. I was in command of a unit. And so I got to see firsthand what was unfolding within the ranks of our military on the one hand, and uh, also happened to have, on the other hand, studied uh, Marxist history and communist revolutions. And so I was able to weave the two together into that book. 
I was uh, fired uh, subsequent to writing that book. The week following the publication of that book, I was fired on May 14th of 2020, 2021, excuse me, 2021, I'm getting my years mixed up. And uh, for three months was under investigation by the Department of the Air Force, so they allege. Uh, I was honorably discharged, although I lost my pension in the process uh, in September of 2021. Uh, the reason for which I was fired, by the way, was political partisanship. And I want to make a point of this briefly before turning it back over to Professor Jacobson. Uh, again, I want to reiterate, uh, I was not a political animal. I tried to take care not to criticize my chain of command or to say something that would have been construed as politically partisan, but I did attack Marxist ideology. And somehow that was deemed politically partisan. And what's unfortunate for all of our service members is that at the moment and for the past couple of years, uh, to say something that approximates left-wing political ideology is something that will not get you in trouble in the United States military. It's almost, um, it's a protected class almost. You can share that political worldview, but to point out that someone is being politically partisan, to try and hold people accountable for their political partisanship, or to point out that someone is uh, sharing a Marxist uh, party line is to be labeled politically partisan. That's a really big problem for our armed forces. And um, I saw that early, which is why I wrote the book. Uh, many, many people are waking up to this problem now. We've got many good people in, in uniform. We've got courageous service members. They're trying to speak up. And the organization with which I'm working, STARS, is a group of uh, what I'll call a thoroughbred team of veterans, uh, many high-ranking veterans, who take this very seriously because we want to believe in our military and we want our service members to be incentivized to stay put and serve uh, both in good conscience and in integrity and honor, uh, but also because they love being in uniform. Uh, we don't want uh, to continue losing people, and we want to be able to attract uh, the appropriate talent so that we can retain a lethal force. And unfortunately, what we're seeing come out of our senior military leaders at the moment, that's also driven by the Biden administration by policy, uh, is disincentivizing service. It's hurting recruitment and retention. So a lot more to say on all of those things. That's about as good as I can do at an elevator speech. And so I'll, I'll turn it back over to Kimberly and Professor Jacobson and happy to answer any questions. I think you're I have a, I have a question for you, Matt. Like, what is it that you observed that drove you to speak out? Was it an incident? Was it a series of incidents? Was it just a generalized feeling? Uh, what was it that motivated you? Yeah, yeah, there were very specific things. It wasn't just a generalized feeling. You know, it's funny that you ask. I had an interview just a couple of days ago in person down in Dallas with Blaze Media, uh, the, their director of uh, production. And um, after I shared for about a half an hour some details about, about my experience, uh, she said, well, is there anyone on active duty that can corroborate what you're saying, or is this all just kind of anecdotal? And I said, well, let me remind you, uh, I was on active duty when all this was happening, and I was a commander in the Space Force, and you know, we're, we're still being fed on a week-by-week -week basis uh, from very good sources that this is still happening. But specifically to your question, um, I had, uh, again, the space commander pushing out videos that he would find on YouTube. They weren't officially sanctioned DOD videos, uh, although there have now been some of those as well. Uh, there were Netflix documentaries. There were Amazon Prime uh, movies, and he would assign these as homework to the base. And we had all branches of the military at our base. Uh, that if you were familiar with... Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones 1619 project, you recognize that a lot of the narrative came right out of that anti-historical uh, and ideologically rooted uh, narrative of American history. In fact, it's not just uh, right-wingers or conservatives that view that history that way. People on both sides of the political aisle, Democrat and Republican well-respected historians have come out critical of the 1619 project history. Uh, so at my base, Specifically, what I was seeing at that time was anti-American. Again, it was the oppressor versus oppressed narrative. We were taking down days to discuss race in America and how we can improve race relations in America. And, you know, 
again, at face value, someone might say, well, what's wrong with that? And I'll, I'll let you know that if you've served in uniform, the people, there's people listening to this call that have served in uniform, there's not a more unified group of people in this country than those who serve in uniform. We put on the same uniform, regardless of our upbringing, whether we've got one parent or two, whether we were rich or poor, whether we're black or white or Native American or something else, we all get the same ugly haircut when we join up and we bleed the same color. And it's driven into us that we're supposed to be a political when we join up to serve in this country. Uh, and we leave the partisan policy disputes to the American people. That's their right. That's not for us to get into uh, political ideology. You don't talk about religion and politics in the, at the dinner table or in the military workplace in one sense of, of speaking because they're divisive or they can be. And so it's a really good practice for our service members to avoid this stuff altogether. But in fact, it's being driven from the top down. Uh, that's clear now, and it really um, allows for these younger service members an opportunity to parrot what they're hearing come out of their senior leaders. So after George Floyd's death, if a couple of senior uh, leaders, both enlisted and officer, including the, the sitting chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, want to say, I am George Floyd, or I'm a black man first and an airman second, uh, every time I see police lights come on in the rearview mirror, I fear for my life. They're politicizing the workplace at once. Uh, they're injecting their... Now, they might have a real sense for those things and a real lived experience with those things, but there was an agenda afoot that has never ceased. And uh, I reach out to commanders at other bases to, to kind of corroborate my own experience and say, hey, is this just happening at my base or is it also happening at, at your bases? And I'll tell you the rate of change is different at every base, and it depends on the leadership of the base. Uh, but this is infecting bases across the world. It's not It's not just a one-off phenomenon. It's not just at the U United States Air Force Academy, um, where they now have diversity and inclusion political commissars who wear purple ropes over the shoulder uh, to, as, a, as a spectacle in each squadron so that cadets know where they need to turn in case they uh, have any complaints, for example. This is not just there, it's everywhere. Uh, now, some people are slower to wake up to it than others, but, um, uh, you know, every time I, I go speak somewhere, I take 45 minutes and slowly, methodically lay out a list of things, a kind of a laundry list of things we've heard and seen. Uh, very disheartening for the American people. It sounds like complaining again, sometimes, uh, if it's not properly couched, but it's meant to be informative because there are certain things we need to do right now if we expect to change course. I, I agree with you. Uh, shining a light on what's happening, no matter where it is, is not complaining, okay? Uh, and I think that's maybe a defensive tactic that people use to say you're just a complainer. Um, I would be very curious, uh, not 45 minutes worth, but some more examples, because I think people here would want to hear some specifics. If there's any okay. three or four or five that you think are most dramatic, I'd love to hear them. So let, let me share one thing that recently came up, um, because... This got a lot of attention, and it also gives us some insight in how we might start fixing this problem, okay? Uh, if you hadn't already seen, many Americans haven't, uh, but but many some have, there were some training slides that were leaked by cadets at the Air Force Academy to parents and in turn to STARS, and they showed up in Fox News and other places. And in one of the training slides, there was encouragement, I guess you could say, or discouragement from using terms like mom and dad, which are not inclusive. Again, part of the idea that it's important to be sensitive and inclusive. And so you might find other better terms like parent one, parent two, or guardian one, guardian two, rather than mom and dad, because heaven forbid you offend someone that, that didn't have uh, both parents at home. Well, the reason I want to bring up this example in particular is because as we start to look for ways to solve these problems, there is a really remarkable response uh, to the, that information leaking out to the American people. Parents were enraged that that was in training slides at the Air Force Academy. There was quibbling on behalf of the superintendent, General Rich Clark, as to whether or not he ever knew about ahead of time or condoned those slides, and it almost doesn't matter. What matters, and the point I want to make, is that parents were upset that their young people that were going to get an excellent education with the purpose of becoming uh, officers of character and honor and integrity were being trained 
uh, that kind of an ideologically based uh, training slide or education. And so there's pushback that came out of parents. And Rich Clark, the superintendent, found himself in a position at once of having to respond to parents. And so he spent time counseling with the Association of Graduates and Attorneys, it seems to me, on how best to respond quickly to parents, because you don't want to upset the parents of the cadets at your service academies. Some of them are donors. Uh, they're very invested in the education of, of their, their children, their sons and their daughters. Many of them are veterans. Many of them have good congressional contacts. Parents need to be aware of what's going on at service academies. Grandparents need to be aware and they need to speak up about it and they need to get Congress involved and they need to let the superintendents at these schools know that they're aware of what's going on and start to push back because there's nothing like an upset parent to change course at, a, at an institution like this. Uh, you know, you saw this in schools. This isn't really Stars Lane or my lane, but schools across the country in the past year when parents get involved and they're ferocious, uh, some change begins to take place. And so I wanted to bring up these training slides because the response to something like that really taught us something important. Uh, and so we kind of like uh, telling parents about what's going on and uh, they tend to get involved. And, um, you know, I've had, uh, th there's something, I've got it here on my desk. In fact, let me just make one more point about this. This imprimus that I get from Hillsdale College uh, every month. Um, the most recent one I received is by Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale. And the title of his talk that this was based on was Education as a Battleground. And he said, if a foundation changes, then the things that are built on the foundation are changed. And then he goes on to say that he believes education writ large is foundational or fundamental. And if it changes radically as it has over the past couple of decades, it changes everything else in society. And I wanna make the, the parallel or the comparison to our service academies. If there have been radical changes to the way we go about education of our future officers at our service academies, it will substantially change the output that we get out of these service academies. Are you looking for leaders of character, integrity, and honor? Or are you looking for ideologues who come out of our service academies who are sensitive and nice and who have been properly trained on the trans and queer agenda? We haven't talked about that yet, but that's a big, that's, that's a big movement in the making in our services are trained on proper uh, discussion of race relation topics in a Marxist bent. Um, you know, so we, we've got our, our work cut out for us. We've got an uphill battle here. And it seems that at our service academies, th these aren't just retirees and veterans who are teaching our cadets at our service academies. We made a push a uh, number of years back to start to replace the veteran teaching force with more respected civilian academics, PhDs, and so forth. And in doing so, we've also introduced leftism into our service academies. And so we more closely approximate uh, the Ivy League schools that, you, that you've for some time now heard that these things are taking uh, place at. I'm curious about, uh, you mentioned something, I think it was a purple, something purple on the shoulder. Yeah. Um, is, that uh, is kind of eerie. These are essentially the DEI officers and how are they embedded? Um, yeah, when I was an aide de camp for a four star, for example, I wore an agulet, I think is what we call the, the ropes that hang over your shoulder, a silver rope that would distinguish you from others that are wearing the same uniform as you. And at once, I mean, there's some history there that goes back a long, long time. But that aside, uh, there are not just purple ropes, as I understand it. I think they're starting to hand out ropes to different officers who have different functions. I may be wrong. They're black or purple ropes that our diversity and inclusion officers have. I called them political commissars because in my view, I don't think it's a stretch to say that's precisely what they are. They've been trained that they've got a very particular role to play. Uh, they can be spotted easily and people know where they need to go in order to report either harassment, abuse, or get counseling on race-related issues or anything that looks like it's somehow related to inclusion or equity initiatives. And they're also a visible presence so that people know, hey, they're walking around and they 
are watching what's going on and they too have a chain of command that they can tell about what's happening within the halls of our our building if they see something amiss back to my base uh there were officers well i say officers uh, they could have been enlisted or officer but they were appointees officers at the base underneath the base commander who were in the in club or the in group so to speak who were aware of what the base commander's push was who would then report back to the base commander what they were seeing on the base it turned into a tattletale regime uh, and i confronted one person one day i shouldn't I, I i get a little bit leery about i'm willing to mention certain names like the base commander because that's now public and there were civilian employees working on that base um who i won't name some of whom are still there and they prefer to be be left private but they were bullied into a position of reporting to the base commander things they were seeing one woman who worked at the gym admitted to me when i confronted her i said are you spying on i i, I said are you spying on these young people that come in here and reporting back i'm and i won't share with you what i saw happening and she said yes i've been asked to say what i'm seeing and to report back um there was a there was a meeting that took place in the base headquarters of buckley air force base with the white employees they were the only ones that were supposed to come the black base commander informed the white employees at his base this i've shared this all before it's not, it's not new it's out there it's floating around somewhere in the world wide web <laughs> uh, and senior leaders of the services are aware of this too um and he informed them <clears throat> no one at my base will stand in the way of the black lives matter movement's agenda and i found this out months after I had filed a written uh, inspector general's complaint after I'd written a book. Some of them reached out to me privately. We met in private and they said we were so afraid to even file a written inspector general's complaint because of the climate that was being created at that base. We didn't know what to do. One of them had written a written complaint and sent it to a, to a senator. And I, he asked me to follow up with that senator's office because STARS works closely with that senator's office. And it got buried in a pile of paperwork because, you know, why would they, you know, they get lots of uh, mail. So <clears throat> that's, that's the very kind of climate that's created when you have a bully who has a protected status who pushes a particular political ideology, who has rope-wearing cadets, who are the eyes and ears that report back up a chain. You have a tattletale climate. It's a fearful climate, and people are afraid to speak up. Now, I think, it's just my sense, that you've got... Um, I really do believe that you've got the preponderance of people in uniform, regardless of their political views, regardless of their race, of course, who... Are, want to be courageous whether or not they are and who do love their country that's why you sign up to serve in an all-volunteer force it takes a little bit of time to be properly educated and to know what you're talking about to some degree before you have the courage then to stand up in the right setting and say you know i disagree with what's being said respectfully and that doesn't sit right with me or i don't like what i'm hearing in this training session and so with all due respect, I'm going to disagree and I can't quite articulate why I disagree. But, you know, people are starting to do that. And some people are resigning because in, in kind of protest to what they're seeing, whether it's what they consider to be an immoral, unethical or illegal shot mandate, for example. Happy to get into that later if we need to or want to. And they get one day of media attention and they disappear forever and the American people never hear about them. And so it's really hard to feel like you're making an impact being courageous when you simply slip between the cracks and disappear and so it really takes parents getting involved it takes organizations like legal insurrection getting involved and stars getting involved and others that we partner with it takes uh service members who wear their uniform 
to get involved and to start to push back in order for there to be enough momentum to really make some change. And then realistically, it takes elected officials getting involved and holding our senior military leaders accountable. That's that's also an uphill fight, but we've got some good um, progress there. And in fact, the shock mandate is going to be eliminated, it looks like, uh, in the uh, 2023 National Defense Authorization Act. You know, we see a lot of reports in the, the general media about recruiting problems in the military. Um, and if, and there's probably truth to this, basically, you know, people of military age, generally speaking, are overweight and out of shape, right? Okay, like the rest of the country. Okay. Um, and I have no doubt, at least in my mind, that that probably makes recruiting harder because you have to meet certain standards. That's right. Um, but... Do you think that this loss of trust in the military, I mean, I think somebody, I forget if it was Gallup's, just came out and trust in the military is at an all time low among the population. Um, you know, is this one big problem? Do you see this wokeness problem as a factor in all of this? Because, you know, it's extremely concerning, okay? Uh, it's extremely concerning to us in the country who are civilians uh, as to what we hear going on in the military. Where do you see this fitting into the more general problems that the military is having? Yeah, th there are a number of factors in the recruiting problem. Uh, I can't talk to all of them. I, I don't have time to talk to all of them, but wokeness fits into the in, into the probably several big reasons why we're facing some recruitment uh, issues. It, the shop mandate is right up there. Now, whether you want to consider that a part of a radical agenda or just bad policy, uh, there are four federal courts now that have, uh, that have determined that that uh, was uh, potentially illegal. There have been injunctions issued against the Navy and Air Force, which also includes the Space Force, saying that those service members who have filed a religious accommodation request cannot be punished uh, while while the injunction is in place. Now, I don't know how the NDAA is going to impact that, but we've already had upwards of 8,000 service members purged or deleted is probably the right way to put it, frankly, uh, separated, discharged. And we've had tens of thousands of other service members who have been treated poorly uh, in the flying community, uh, which is my former community. Before I was Space Force, I flew jets in the Air Force. Uh, there were hundreds of pilots grounded. Some of them were back on flying status. Some of them, despite the injunction, which was upheld, by the way, in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, are are still grounded after a year of being grounded. Uh, it's not easy to get these people back in the cockpit, by the way, after they've been out for a year. You're basically uh, going through the training pipeline again. Uh, and so not only are we hurting now, think so not only are we hurting recruitment because of wokeness, critical race theory, diversity and inclusion initi initiatives, transgender agenda, queer agenda, and I didn't say being gay. There's a difference between the queer and trans agenda. It's very different. In fact, good people have written about this stuff. Uh, there's an agenda. Uh, and all of that that maybe is under an um, umbrella of wokeism, that disincentivizes people from joining because it's not aligned with their values. And that's not why they want to sign up in an all-volunteer force. But the shop mandate plays into this. There's health issues that you mentioned. Uh, there's the lack of qualified applicants for academic reasons. That's why the Army, it seems, temporarily announced, hey, we're going to get rid of the requirement for a high school diploma. They faced a lot of pushback, and they said, eh, they backtracked and said, well, we're not that serious about that. Never mind. And so they're finding ways to um, solve what they see as a recruitment problem. But one thing that uh, people don't normally talk about and that doesn't normally show up in the headlines is the retention problem. Because at once immediately at a glance, we can see that we've got recruitment issues, like the army numbers were reported on for a couple of months. Retention is a, diff a more difficult problem to measure or gauge at a glance because people have active duty service commitments that they're still fulfilling. Someone today might be disinterested in, in further service, but they're not going to be able to get out until the fall of 2023. They might not be able to retire until the spring of 2024. And we're going to continue to see a trickle out of our service members, assuming they're allowed to leave, uh, who are currently disincentivized by the current 
policy of the Biden administration who are discouraged by the misplaced priorities of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and some of what they've seen come out of the mouth of the Chairman of uh, Joint Chiefs, uh, Mark Milley, and what's happening at their own bases or service academies. Uh, that's really bad news. Again, you can't measure retention at a glance. In fact, I've seen a couple of statements from senior military leaders that indicate that they're dismissing outright that we have a retention issue. Uh, there's, I think they've got a better sense than that. I think they're concerned about that. That's why there's things like draft our daughters legislation and uh, that they've been pushing in the Defense Authorization Act. Let me say this too, by the way, this is, I'm, I'm glad I've remembered this. In October, the Secretary of Defense put out a policy memorandum to the force about the Supreme Court's decision on Roe v. Wade. And he even was willing to politicize that issue in the immediate run-up to the midterms, saying that the Supreme Court's decision to return this to the states is going to impact the readiness of our military forces because and i've got i've got the, the quote i don't want to look it up i've got it right here no, i've got it on my phone i won't look it up uh but i'll paraphrase and it's accurate enough he said it would impact the readiness of the force and it would hurt recruitment and retention of our force now i i guarantee you six months from now when retention is continuing to suffer and recruitment is continuing to suffer, we're going to point to things like the Supreme Court decision as if that is what is discouraging young men and women who are patriotic and love their country from, from signing up to serve in an all-volunteer force. And that's totally bogus. That's not the driving force behind our recruitment and retention was, although they'll point to it, uh, just like uh, inflation is Putin's fault. Now, you know, it's like all these problems, they arise. I'm not, you know, necessarily, so I, those are, these are just, this is me speaking off the cuff. I'm not talking on behalf of stars or anyone. I mean, this is, this is always trying to lay the blame somewhere else and not take responsibility uh, for the root cause and doing a root cause analysis of what's, what's driving people out the door. This is more anecdotal. I've got a friend who's a lieutenant colonel, two below the zone to lieutenant colonel, F-15. I won't say which F-15 community. I already went too far. Uh, you know, he's turning down senior developmental ed education in the, in the Air Force. He's commander. Uh, he's going he's gonna to split at 20. And he said all of his uh, peer commanders are done because they're so disgusted with the direction of the military. Now, that's, again, that sound, this is sounding like complaining. This is important for people to talk about because unless we get a grip on this really quickly, uh, you're going to be left with, you know, you talk about um, qualifications, not quotas. We want a meritocratic based military so we can be lethal and ready and capable. If all of your capable leaders who've been promoted early and who are, who are skilled are leaving the force because we're focusing on the wrong things, well, you're left with a bunch of less qualified people to lead. Uh, and that's a frightening prospect for the American people. So uh, it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's time to find some solutions here. I was surprised when you said parents complaining can have an impact. That's not something I would have thought about. Um, what, let's turn to the solution side of thing. What can people do? Or, or is there one or multiple solutions to reversing the trend that seems to be underway. I'm glad we're changing gears. I'll say almost as an apology, I'm sometimes a weak voice for these issues. You know, I'm humbled by the, I work with people who really stay on top of these issues at STARS. Uh, and so I, I know that there's some of them listening here. So forgive me if there's a hundred things you've thought of that I've not said, by the way, uh, I can't look at all the chat comments coming in as I think. But there really are, you know, what I've said is a glimpse of what's taking place. Uh, and if you are involved in the muddy circles that we're trying to swim in right now and, and, and filter through all of the data that comes to us as an organization, you'd be disgusted like we are and discouraged. And you think, God help me, I can't do anything but stay in this arena to try and keep making a difference. And so it's good that we get to talk about some solutions uh, to the problems. Now, on the one hand, uh, policy and elected officials make a tremendous difference. Uh, 
in one fell swoop with an executive order in September of 2020, as I mentioned, President Trump was able to ban the use of critical race theory jargon and eliminate diversity and inclusion trainings in the uniformed services. That kind of thing matters. We're not going to get that in the current administration. In fact, as you've seen, if you've paid attention to the headlines, even though we had an overwhelmingly bipartisan support for this from the House for the National Defense Authorization Act, which includes the provision to eliminate the uh, uh, shot mandate for our service members. It was a 350 to 80 vote. Uh, the Biden administration has said they don't agree with that decision. And Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has said that he'd like to keep the mandate in place. Uh, so uh, it's either bad thinking or he's just a compliant pawn in the hands of the Biden administration. Uh, either way, uh, given, uh, I want to say something else about that too. Darn, you know, this is the trouble with. Um, <laughs> there's too much information to share. I do want to talk solving the problems. Not only are we hurting our readiness by bad policy, by grounding pilots and, and taking others out of their jobs and career fields for not taking the vaccine, we've hurt readiness because people have taken the vaccine and are being injured and facing terrible consequences for their decisions. And um, again, th there's so much that's, you know, it's anecdotal at the moment, but we hear stories all the time. And I just spoke with a young woman on the phone last week who played five sports as a terrific athlete, uh, the kind of person who's fit to serve in our military, who took the first shot, got sick and never quite recovered. And after the second shot has suffered heart attacks, strokes, is having blood clots and has been in and out of the ER and is trying to fight to have TRICARE cover her bills. That's one story of lots and lots of stories just like hers. And we gotta, we gotta help these people. And they're a part of the, the solutions going forward. So I wanna mention that, but it's stupid. It, and frankly, it's quite stupid to insist on keeping a vaccine mandate in effect that you know now is hurting your force. And 98% of your force has been vaccinated. And so whatever your views were about the vaccine, take a look at the data. And, and and see what you're doing to your readiness. Uh, just foolish to insist that you keep that in place. Now, while policy is an important way uh, to get things fixed, uh, we need to start thinking, we need to, we need to have uh, elected officials who are serious about holding our senior military leaders accountable for bad policy, uh, for misplaced priorities. And when you've got people like Admiral Gilday or a, a chairman, uh, uh, Mark Milley or Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, who surrounds himself with advisors who've got uh, uh, really, frankly, radical political views uh, and a history of, uh, of political activism. Uh, we, need, we need elected officials to step in and, and hold these people accountable. Now, there have been hearings held, but we had a Democrat-controlled Congress that was impotent to, to make any change or didn't, didn't want to make any change, frankly. And so these people were protected. Uh, and so it remains to be seen whether or not we'll get any serious change in that regard, even with a Republican House. Now, back to where I think we really, frankly, can uh, make a big difference. You know, STARS tries to educate Congress. We're educating the American people. We're educating our service members who are very grateful for what we can share with them. And we're, we're growing our congressional network uh, um, by the week, it seems. We've got staffers who we share information with who are very interested in receiving our information and some congressmen who six months ago were discouraged at any making any prospects or headway in the shop mandate, for example, but stars kept pounding down their door and, and our chairman of the board, three-star uh, General Rod Bishop, has a great connection with these congressmen and he's been relentless. And, you know, with there, there's a certain quality and quantity. And they've been seeing a lot come from stars by way of the adverse effects of these mandates, uh, why they've been a bad idea. And with the newly elected House, um, we've been happy to think that we've had some small impact in the momentum that the House now feels in putting forth this bill. So I'm really grateful to work with an organization that's been so activist in educating Congress and their staffers. Let me say this to the listener. If you're not sure how to engage with your congressman, your elected official, your staffer, then send your congressional uh, uh, contact information to STARS. You can go to stars.us, uh, send us a little comment, sign up for our newsletter, and send us a note and say, hey, will you please uh, add this 
congressional contact your list. We'll make contact. We'll ask them if they mind being added to our email lists. And, and we'll start to share the information that we're getting from our service members with them. And by and by, they'll become interested in, in trying to change policy, hold senior military leaders accountable, and uh, and hopefully make a difference. Uh, if you're a parent, let your let your uh, let me let me clarify what I mean. I'm getting ahead of myself. I've had a long three days. I'm running on a little sleep, and so I'm a little bit uh, erratic here. If you are a parent of a service member and you're concerned about what your son or daughter is experiencing in the service, uh, you should reach out to the commander of your son or daughter. Let them know you're concerned about what the son or daughter is telling you. I've spoken to parents when I was in command. And uh, it's great to talk to parents when you have good things to share uh, about what their their youth are doing. It's not a pleasant conversation if you've got to tell them ugly things that are happening. And for a parent to call and express concern in a respectful manner will really start to get people thinking about what they're doing. Uh, parents can really get involved. You can talk to uh, the superintendents of the service academies. If you're a veteran, you're a grandparent, uh, whether or not you've got young people at the service academies, write a letter. Uh, let them know what you're thinking. Uh, join join a group uh, like uh, STARS that um, has a, a vast and rapidly growing network of other concerned uh, citizens. Sometimes we've got initiatives where we'll have people sign on to letters that are written. Uh, you can add your name to those letters. Those are all little things. And if you go to the STARS website, we've got some other uh, real-world um, uh, practical uh, actions that you can take uh, as a citizen to get involved. There's probably a bunch of comments coming in, by the way. I see 87 chat comments, and so I'm sure yeah. others are throwing out ideas as well. There, there's a lot of good ideas that conversations like this can generate. I would say um, I do really appreciate your comments about parental involvement and engagement because we've been at least kind of in one particular sphere of the wokeness um, bit, we've been engaged in the critical race exposure for several years now, and we're kind of first to that space. And so we have talked to and heard from countless parents over the years about this issue. There's always concern about blowback. There's always concern mm -hmm. about what might happen if they were to say something. And I think it's something I'll just go ahead and use this opportunity to inject something that I'm very passionate about, which is to remind everyone that's listening that you're not alone. Mm. And that the only way these things change is that if we get involved and if we get engaged and my children are very small, so I'm looking at all of this in horror and dread and in very different ways <laughs> and have made life decisions accordingly, but not doing something is really no longer an option, you know, because the way I kind of rationalize my decision to get more involved and to make life choices for my children that, um, that I guess prevent them from being exposed to this kind of toxicity so early on, um, th there's always, there's always a choice to make. There's always some kind of pain. So you're either going to experience a little bit of pain and inconvenience and uncomfortability mm. now, or you're going to experience a great deal more later if we don't do anything, if we don't speak up. And it could be as simple, and that doesn't mean you have to go run for school board and overhaul everything <laughs> or right. even run for Congress. It's as simple as asking questions. It's as simple as, you know, getting involved in, and as you suggested, Matt, reaching out to a commander and finding out what's going on and why and who's responsible for this and what more could be done if it's something that you know you as a parent believe is particularly noxious and inappropriate for your mm -hmm. kids to be um inundated with and so i we i've started off i guess with this this lecture years ago just encouraging people to do something um regardless of the consequence but now we're kind of reaching a point, I believe, not just with the military wokeness, but culturally as well, where it is, we're truly in a situation that we can't continue to just wait for someone else to show up and change things, because that's not going to happen. <laughs> it, it's just not. We have to do what we can in our spheres, even mm. in whatever small way that is. And if, if every single person on this call 
we're making a call to someone else, whether it's an elected official, whether it's withholding funding from someone or something that's perpetrating toxic ideas, you know, whatever that is, if everyone were to exercise a little bit of their power and authority, which we already have, we're not at the mercy of, of these systems. And I think that's something we do forget. Um, I think the change would be dramatic and I think it would really start to shift things in a favorable direction. And mm. so yeah. I just wanted to kind of, to drop that into the discussion as well. Let, let me share a thought on uh, and piggyback on what you said, Kimberly. I, I'm, I'm thinking about what you said and I think it's a thought that just about any normal person is going to have and it's what might happen if I say something. Uh, service members think it, citizens think it, and ask yourself, and it's okay to ask that question. It's important to ask that question. Ask yourself also, what if no one said anything ever? And uh, that's in, in fact why I wrote my book. It's because you have to be warned where this leads if no one says anything ever. I'm not a political activist by nature. Um. There's, there's some days or weeks where I just downright don't like being in this arena. And uh, in fact, sometimes I've tried to escape this arena and God sucks me right back into it. It's like, well, you're going to be around here a little while, you know. It's uncomfortable. Even for those that some, you look to some people and think, well, at least they're doing the fight. Well, it's uncomfortable for some of them too. Um, so so think think through both sides there what, what happens if i don't say anything and try and learn try and be respectful try and articulate your point and lift where you stand and work within your sphere of influence and most of us have a pretty small sphere of influence and that's okay tell us a little bit more about your organization um, how people can reach you mm -hmm. and is it only for people who used to serve who are former military or can anybody join it and participate Great questions. I'm glad you've given an opportunity to talk about it. Let me just share a little bit of background first. Um, while I was writing a formal complaint to the inspector general, um, there were these uh, veterans, predominantly Air Force Academy graduates, uh, who uh, were noticing some of these uh, woke you know, in particular, it was a football team video that was put out online um, that chanted Black Lives Matter like seven times in an angry tone. And they saw that and they were put off. And they said, why the divisiveness? Why the harsh tone? And uh, that started them looking into what was happening at the Air Force Academy. And eventually that group turned into what is now STARS. STARS stands for Stand Together Against Racism and Radicalism in the Services. It's a clever play on words because it, it came at a time in which the Secretary of Defense, too, was saying he was trying to uh, to bear down on racism and radicalism in the services. And so, yeah, we're doing the same thing, but we're really interested in removing part, partisan politics altogether from the military. STARS yeah. is now about two years old. Uh, it's a tax exempt, uh, it got a tax exempt adjudication from the IRS, I guess, about a year and a half ago, and it's done about five years worth of work in the past year and a half. Uh, we've got, uh, over a hundred media appearances, probably close to 130 or 40 media appearances on, um, uh, center right media outlets and podcasts to include big ones like, uh, Mike Huckabee's show, Fox and Friends, Tucker Carlson, Steve Bannon's War Room and others, um, We've uh, authored over 130 or 40 articles that have been published, and we're now collaborating with um, uh, larger organizations you've heard of and smaller organizations you've not, uh, like the Heritage Foundation, who recently put out its 2023 strength assessment of the United States military, rating it as weak. Uh, we've been, uh, General, General Bishop uh, is working with the Heritage Foundation uh, closely on a new uh, board or panel that it's just established to fight wokeism in the military. And we're, of course, uh, collaborating now with Legal Insurrection Foundation. Uh, and there are others you've not heard of, but if you go to the stars.us website, it's stars with two R's, dot US uh, website, you'll see some of our partners there that we're collaborating with. 
Uh, we've got a new website site, in fact, that is nearing completion. It'll be available, uh, I think, this week. That's going to come as news to the STARS folks that are currently on this call listening. Uh, but it's something that we've been working on, and it, it, it will amplify the uh, amount of work that STARS has really been putting in over the past couple of years. It's a tremendous amount of work by a really dedicated group of people. Do you have to be a veteran to join STARS? No, you do not. Uh, the STARS is predominantly, it was founded by veterans, concerned veterans, and again, predominantly Air Force Academy veterans. But we've got uh, members of, we've got veterans from all branches of the military, uh, more or less, who are on our team. You know, our vice chairman of the board is a retired Army general. We've got um, uh, Navy veterans uh, working with us. And we've had support, although not been formally joined, by uh, U.S. Coast Guard admiral and uh, other uh, veterans from the coast guard who have tried to go to bat for seven coast guard cadets at the coast guard academy who were kicked out over the vaccine uh, mandate and their unwillingness to take the shot i think we're, we're probably going to see uh, maybe five out of the seven of them choose to return to the coast guard academy if the coast guard academy will have them back after the mandate is uh, removed next year now uh, people can go on stars.us and sign up to receive our newsletters. They can uh, send us a note saying that they'd like to volunteer to help us, and we'd be happy to onboard them and, and have their help. And I, I foresee that while STARS is kind of a compact team of workers at the moment, us growing really rapidly here over the next year to have, hopefully, what I would see as regional directors and local chapters um, that will be in every state, uh, who will be in uh, both the school systems, I hope, and also every base of every branch, and we'll be feeding material and information that is educational in nature about America's founding and America's fo the greatness of the American ideal and our founding principles and values so that we can help educate our service members uh, and, and be embedded with our, our school system, just like the 1619 Project was embedded in all of the school system uh, we have good people trying to help shape the, the public education arena as well. Uh, and we're also going to hopefully, in establishing that hierarchy of sorts, uh, have an intelligence apparatus to further our education mission with volunteers at these bases feeding us information on a weekly basis that we can um, uh, compile, amalgamate, and and turn into um, reports that are, we can share on an, uh, as part of our educational outreach with Congress. And so we're really doing a tremendous amount of work that I think uh, people will be excited to hear about and, and happy to sign up to e at least read about in our newsletters, if not come and support. Some questions from the Q&A. One right. question is, what did General Raymond do after you pointed out the rogue base commander? Great question. Uh, I spent more time with General Raymond in one year than I spent with my own wife. Know him well. He knows my wife and kids by name. I think we respect each other. I, I say that, but he hasn't spoken with me since May of 2021 when my book was published. Um, I, I, I respect General Raymond as a good leader and necessary at the time that we stood up the Space Force. I think he doesn't like the political arena. I think he's he finds what pro it's my guess that he found what I've done distasteful and inappropriate. Um, what did he do? Well, he promoted uh, the base commander to his first star and fired me. That's what he did. Now, that was done by three star Stephen Whiting. These are people I respected a great deal. I never publicly criticized them. Uh, so I suppose my only criticism of them at this point would be I wish they had some more courage. Because unless we have senior leaders like them who are well-respected uh, in the industry speaking up and saying this stuff has got to end, it's really hard to make some progress. And uh, frankly, they knew it was untrue. that that They issued a press release saying they lost their trust and confidence in me to lead their troops. That's untrue because they had a great deal of respect and trust and confidence in my ability to lead. And uh, they had to say that, and they had to cover their own backs and heads. And um, if my head rolled, they might just preserve theirs. That's the way I see it. That's putting it bluntly. And so uh, General Raymond just retired. 
and there's a new uh, chief of space operations who sits on the Joint Chiefs, Salty Saltzman. Salty is his call sign. He's a talented space officer. He's a common sense guy. I sure hope he's willing to uh, put his foot down on some of this and make some appropriate cultural shifts in his new branch of the military before it's lost to uh, wokeness. Okay, let's see. We have a handful of questions um, here. And I think this is an interesting one. And I, I understand that what I'm asking would require a speculative answer. Um, but it's what I is like speculating. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, then. Perfect. So, uh, what is the purpose of turning the military against America if you want to view imposing this kind of ideology as being anti American, which okay. I believe it is? Well, you know, I, I think I can answer that without speculating. Now, I think it's speculating to insist that those who participate at senior military leadership levels are complicit, or it, it's speculative to insist that they know what they're doing and they're trying to destroy um, the unity of the force. In fact, most people probably aren't trying to do that. If I was Xi Jinping, I would not be interested ever in setting a boot on American soil and lobbing missiles uh, over the poles at the United States uh, if I saw what was going on in this country right now. In fact, I'd further uh, our domestic disputes by engaging on social media, uh, creating platforms, uh, bots on social media to further uh, dump some fuel on the fire and further our dispute and polar polarizing conflicts. I'd uh, put police stations up in various cities. I'd buy up farmland near U.S. military bases. And I'd uh, wage information warfare and watch us destroy ourselves. And so if I was in his shoes, and I just use his, him as, a, as an example, I'd be really happy to see the current policy that Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is pursuing. I'd be happy to see the policy, especially the energy policy that Joe Biden is pursuing. But from a national security perspective, um, you know, to see news headlines about America's military being divided. I, I'm generating some of those headlines with stars, by the way. And so the critic might point at that and say, well, you're making the problem worse. You're dividing people by sharing. No, they're making things worse by, do, by enacting terrible policy. We need to talk about the terrible things they're doing, unfortunately, forever to make a difference. So um, the, the question I've kind of answered by saying uh, it's, you can't do things much better if you're trying to destroy the the integrity or unity of a military force than the current policy that we've got. But whether or not those in senior leadership positions are wittingly doing so is an entirely different question. And I think, frankly, some might be. Um, but some are probably just compliant pawns. I don't think General Austin, former General Austin, uh, Secretary Austin's bright enough to be uh, that crafty and strategic. I think, uh, frankly, he's a fool. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of stars. I'm speaking uh, personally. And uh, as I say publicly all the time, I'm not running for office, so I can offend people and say whatever I want. Uh, I think he doesn't deserve to be a Secretary of Defense. I think he should be fired. Uh, and until we have a better Secretary of Defense who's willing to tell Joe Biden that this policy is wrecking our U.S. military, uh, we're likely to not see a lot change except from the ground up with our service members and parents and veterans. Well, that's, that's a great answer. And I just, I want to thank you for your time. Yeah. Um, and also in the interest of time, just, I guess we'll start with Professor Jacobson and then Matt, will go back to you for final thoughts and comments. Yeah. Well, I want to thank Matt again for informing us on this. I think it's critically important. Um, and much like uh, we, when we talk about what's happening in education, particularly K through 12, we often at Legal Insurrection point to this as a fight for the survival of the country. Because as Matt indicated, if you wanted to destroy this country, what would you do differently than is being done in our education system and now in our military system and in corporations? And I think that's the way people have, have to view it. This is a fight for national survival. And I think the things that Matt has pointed out where we don't often think of K through 12 as national survival, but we do think of the military as national survival. Um, and I think when this history is written, if it's written honestly, um, I think 
we will find that a lot of what is happening in this country is manipulation from abroad um, through social media and other ways. Uh, and it is a form of warfare that's being taken place. And nowhere is that more dramatic than in the US military, which whose purpose is to defend us, okay? Uh, the purpose of a fifth grade teacher is not to defend the country, okay? Uh, but the military is. And so I, I, this really needs to be a wake up call. We would be happy to cooperate in any way that we can with STARS uh, and give whatever publicity we can to the work that you're doing. So I thank you again for being here. And I hope the people who were listening and people, many more will see the videotape, um, uh, take these comments to heart and really focus on what's happening in the military. Yeah, thank you uh, for hosting this. It's an important conversation. It's an ugly conversation. And um, I want to say in closing something that I sometimes forget to say, and it's that I love and I'm grateful for our service members. Uh, there are a lot of good people in uniform, and it's an all-voluntary force. Like I said, I think it's most accurate to say many of them want to be courageous. And I think this provides the perfect context in, for them to learn to be courage, courageous. And um it's disappointing to hear sometimes people say, is there anyone that's courageous in the United States military anymore? Because that's what it seems as people pay attention to the headlines and we, and we hear all the negative things that are happening. There are a lot of courageous men and women in uniform. There's good men and women. And so they deserve our respect and uh, thanks. Uh, I would love to see stars work with service academies and superintendents at those academies, not against them. It's not, we would love to work with senior military leaders and advising them on what we're hearing because often service members are willing to say things to veterans who are concerned that they're not willing to say to their senior leaders or their chain of command. That's too uncomfortable. Wouldn't it be great if stars said to the superintendent of the Air Force Academy, not only are we willing to help you, he said, I'd love your help and let's work together to provide the proper environment for these service members so that we can ensure that we remove partisan politics and we produce leaders of character. So far, my sense is that's not happened. We've been trying to do that. And so it's up to us at the moment to both expose what's going on, to educate others about what's going on embarrassed sometimes if we have to, although we try not to be vindictive. And we're hoping only for the best because this is a critical juncture in American history and it requires the effort of all those who know how to do something and are willing to do something. So if you're listening to this or end up listening to this, I'd say uh, start to become informed if you're not, not already by signing up for the STARS newsletter. And we'll be continuing to work closely with uh, Legal Insurrection and all of our other uh, folks that we're collaborating with uh, to share information with them and to and to point to their resources, you'll become very well informed, and maybe you'll have the courage to become activated enough to make a difference in the sphere of influence that you occupy. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt, and and thanks again for your time and for for stars and all of the work that all of y'all are doing. Um, at least from where I sit, outside of seeing results from the work that we do. Um, the next greatest joy in the workspace here is being able to connect with other people who are doing wonderful things. And that includes STARS and that includes the work that you're doing personally in this space as well, um, which has been of course a, a, great, a great personal cost to you. So thank you for speaking up. Thank you for um, being a voice to this because it's an incredibly important issue and it's, it's really good to have someone out there who's standing up and telling the truth about this. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. And just as a reminder, um, we will be sending the video out to the email you used to register for this event. We'll also be posting it to the blog and we'll be sure to share that with Matt and STARS as well so that um, y'all are able to view this and share it accordingly. And we have, as Matt mentioned, a ton of great resources available for you with a combination of STARS and the Legal Insurrection Foundation. We hope that you will utilize every single one of those. If you have questions, you can reach us very easily. It's just info at legalinsurrection.com. Um, we're always happy to help in any way we can. And if we can't, we will try and find someone who might be able to help you, which, and 
this particular sphere would be Matt and stars. So <laughs> um, maybe start there. But in any case, we want to thank you for all you do. And, um, and thank you to everyone for joining us. And, and we look forward to seeing you on the internet again soon. And um, yeah, everyone have a, a wonderful evening. And we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.